Um, we will be starting with Garrett von Kallenbach. Hi. So my question starting off is with the visual effects, how did you uh, find a balance between the look of the boats and their movements in terms of how do you mix the authenticity with the script elements to be dramatic? Okay. Um, one, um, there wasn't any ocean or, or gimbal, so to speak, um, in the whole project. So we, you know, we did have obviously the set piece that, um, you know, which was mainly the wheelhouse. Uh, we did have um, the kid in Baton Rouge, but we didn't use it um, really in any way, shape or form when it came to the, 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 the environments, the motion, the ocean. Um, it really was a um, uh, kind of a, a a, a daunting project because we didn't have the ability to go out and shoot ocean plates. We didn't have the ability to have, you know, gimbals that that helped us. Um, so we were kind of, we were more going by the script, going by what Tom felt the the environments and just the the the, the awful feeling of being in this situation, not only um, a situation life and death, but also the, the, the environment itself was, you know, pretty much all the way through the film, pretty high seas. Um, and that was all generated in CG. And most of the, pretty much anything you see outside cutting to exteriors um, were all CG. And then what we did use was we, we extracted a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the the actors off the off the kid and put that into the CG to, to create the motion. So it was a um, it was kind of like a lot a lot of the dialogue told the story. Tom's Tom's what was going on in Tom's mind versus what he was saying versus the script, we, we were following a kind of a, uh, let's just say a beat sheet um, to get us through the, the, the couple of days of the story with the environments, with the nights, with the, the, um, the, the attacks with the U-boats, with, the with the tactics, with everything was built around the dialogue in, you know, inside uh, <laughs> Greyhound. So we didn't have anything to reference um, from the show, so to speak, besides a couple of big gimbal shots that we did use, um, but mostly we went to town and built a fleet. And this was not, this was not normal for, for Pete and I. Um, we, we kind of, I came in, looked at the cut, realized that it, it, the dialogue worked. Um, it was very, ta it was very technical in, in a, in a, in a, in a naval sense. Um, but for the viewer, we, they really, we needed to really fill the holes with, with what, what was going on around um, the story. So we had to really get to work and we got to work fast by research, research, research on, on that era period. Ships, uh, obviously, uh, I, um, I built a library for Pete, kept it, kept it very slim and narrow on exactly what we needed to achieve, um, meaning the size, the swell, the look, um, you know, the Beaufort, the Beaufort scale, which is obviously, you know, the winds and, winds and size of ocean, which was pretty much, um, you know, high seas all the way, aside from the funeral. Now, that was um, a classic case of the only time we really used exteriors of, of the ship in Baton Rouge. And as you can see, we had to calm the ocean down to minimal because the, the ship had no, it wasn't on the gimbal, no one's moving. So we had to kind of alter our 
style of of high seas for that moment, which which worked anyway um, for the funeral. But um, we immediately started really um, prevising um, and also really using the dialogue of what we would be doing if we were shooting boat to boat. Um, what would the circumstances be like? What would the uh, equipment be that we would be using? How we would be using it? How, you know, all of this was coming, this was all dialogue to, for Pete and I, Pete to, to, to convey to, to his selected team that he, that he kind of handpicked for the job. We only really had four to five months from, from the, the get go. Uh, the only head start I had was research. Um, and that means everything to do with this movie we found at that period. Um, you know, from, from the guns to, to damage, to explosions, to everything was, was always um, backed with, with, with some realistic visuals of, you know, even to the point of torpedoes, how they sounded, how the five inch guns sounded, how the, you know, the subs, the, it all evolved over time uh, at a really fast pace. And we, kind of felt that we were, you know, we started off with, with a couple of references of some, of some pretty, pretty severe ocean. Um, Pete and I actually felt like we were getting somewhere and that really kind of put the, the energy and steam into to Egg, Pete and his team because we were actually getting something that we were really liking. That, it's a very long-winded, sorry, answer, but I'm trying to frame it for you in the way of the understanding of there was really nothing to work with as besides from a great script and a, and, and a great actor and great interior work. Um, and we, you know, had to go down the route of time stamping the whole show from, from the beginning to the end. And Pete uh, had, had the system um, he did time lapse hasty RIs. We, we were able to use them as our time stamps on all the periods. So the lighting was kind of following the movie. We had, you know, it was, uh, I'll let Pete speak, very military driven uh, movie to get it done. And this is, I'm, I'm saying Pete's words now. So that's kind of a little bit of an answer for you. Uh, uh, I think I think from my perspective, when 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 we were first approached by the client, um, Gareth, regards to this show, time frame was obviously um, something to consider. But equally, obviously, it being a Tom Hanks war film, you couldn't say no, and that's obviously you want to stay authentic and you want to be sure that the quality is guaranteed throughout the entire film. And we were very conscious about authenticity, as were uh, Mike and uh, Tom and the director Aaron, and of course Nathan. They, they did build a huge database of stuff for us. And it was a lot of stuff, which was not previous films, of course, but all genuine stuff, Pathé stuff, grayscale stuff, you know, the really old, good old images of, of, of North Atlantic, um, you know, ships, uh, you know, the escorts and, and the convoy. And there is quite horrific stuff. There's quite horrific there. And to really try to drive the look of the film, it was basically um, weather for me. So um, that was a kind of the, the ocean, obviously it's derived by the lighting, and the ocean, as Nathan may have said in previous interviews, the ocean was another character. So that had to be determined and that was not determined when we came on. Of course, uh, there were a multitude of different assets to do it. And as from a normal perspective, you'd have to do all that. But because of the time frame, we were doing all this in parallel. So we had to get the ocean up and going as best we could. Now, what was fantastic was that Nathan, uh, obviously, so we say, I'd just say the filmmakers put together a beach sheet, right? They blocked out all the film, put what the scenes were in there and what they wanted from your narrative perspective, Gareth, about what they wanted those scenes to feel like, right? Now, if it's just a ship on an ocean, then the weather, lighting, albeit very minimal, and it being winter, North Atlantic, it's a very barren and inhospitable place. Now, thankfully, weirdly enough, being in the UK, our weather is bloody appalling. And it was winter when we started this show, you know, contact is in October, November time, I immediately basically sent out crew to the four corners of the UK to shoot on the coastal regions. Okay, so we needed that clean um, horizon line. 
critical. You can't do it off the top of the building in, in cities because of the light spill, and this then would light the ships and it'd be entirely artificial. So we got a whole multitude of um, time-lapse HDR, essentially. We, we have a thing at Dino called Sky Capture, which is essentially 10 HDR cameras set up on tripods and they do time-lapse. So you can set the time and we just sat there for 12 hours and just did it from you know, dawn till dusk because essentially that's what you are doing in the one-to-one -one time frame with Tom in Greyhound. You're following a beat by beat time of following this captain through this huge ordeal that he has as his first kind of outing as an escort. So um, from that, I looked at all the scenes. Nathan and the team gave us what the oceans, what feel they wanted for it. And obviously Tom's big into this of course about how it should be, you know, whether it's incredibly cold, what the Beaufort should be, how inhospitable it should be, along with hero bits of reference. Now, the database of reference was huge, but really when you deal with the crew and you say, look, I've given you a thousand clips of a Beaufort 9 to 10 here, pick one. It doesn't really help. So Nathan picked one specific, right? And I'd say there was one hero clip that judged 90% of what the ocean was going to look like. And we just matched to that, started from scratch on that before we did any shots. We were like, that's the ocean. That's what it's got to look like. That's got the feel, right? And it's weird when you do a show that one specific thing could actually, actually really be so keystone to look at the film. That, of course, with a few hero shots from some of the pathetic stuff of the real World War II stuff, you know? And um, we then <clears throat> basically put HDI, I did suggestions of what the time of weather and, and ocean look and the sky, HDR, to each of those scenes, okay? Then Nathan just picked those. And then from that, then we then worked up the ocean and worked up key shots throughout each of those scenes. And then what I did was categorize shots within the film that were all typically the same. So, you know, it's not going to be a multitude of different shots every time because it's basically a ship and a camera, right? So there's going to be shots of, of you know, a POV or should you say a slightly cheated POV of Tom's look from the bridge looking at the bow of the ship go into the ocean. It's a very typical shot you see within some of the very historical archive footage. There's probably about 40 or 50 of those shots. So we knew that if I push one of those very, very uh, quickly to the final, then that would develop a look which would govern quite a few shots. And if I had a multitude of those through different scenes in the film, different lighting conditions, night, calm, stormy, icy, then that would give you an idea about what each of those scenes would be. So then I've got a hero shot in each sequence which can show the filmmakers exactly what that sequence would look like at that time. And then I can bring all the other shots up to a similar level, all right? So from, from, from a narrative perspective, again, sorry for the long-winded answer, but the narrative thing was governed by the look and feel and the weather of the ocean and the ship and how it reacts in there. And that's what gave the entire feel from a narrative perspective for the filmmakers. So that was, that's basically where we started. It was essentially weather. See, we're both long-winded answers. We are, yeah. A... <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to ask any questions. Really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it is. For full CG ocean, and, and I mean, look, we all wanted to go and shoot this. Obviously, Nathan and I joined this show quite late, so um, of course we go and shoot plates. Mm. We're both huge believers, and in, in I'm ex Chris Nolan and all the rest of it. I yeah. get as much in camera as I can. I love that. And Mastering Commander for Nathan, of course, is all shooting plates and gimbals, all the rest of it. Unfortunately, it wasn't time for that. CG gives you that latitude and flexibility to create what you need to create. And then from plates that were shot very early on and from reference material, then you can do all you can do is match like for like for that. And, and I mean that from designing the cameras to be a, a boat to boat feel. Nothing in there is any of this magic camera stuff that you have, you know, that was not the intention. It was meant to feel like you were there in amongst it. And that's what was critical to the actual feeling of the film, all right? And um, I think that's what's what's key to a lot of what you see on there, because it gives that genuine sense of authenticity. Because you can create photorealism, right, for this, that's okay. But with a camera, it can take you out of that very, very quickly on shots like this, where the actual media you've got in frame is an ocean and a ship and a sky and the weather, basically. So that's why camera is so critical on a lot of stuff that we did as I well. Think, I think also, because time um, was not, not our friend, and we had this limited time, um, it, it's a, you know it's something that hasn't really been said. But you know, Pete and I, we, Pete and I, didn't actually final verbally to each other because we still felt that we could do so much more. We just didn't have the time, and 
you know, it, the result was great, but we know that if it was a normal film with a normal time frame, we still had a lot of other layers. We were like, you know, we we both, you know, I pushed and pushed for like, you know, it was it was, um, you know, reality versus you know insanity versus you know um, you know knowing that we're on the on the on the on the we were grasping something that we were, I was dubious about originally, you know, for full CG and and um, you know we were we were onto something. Um, another uh, and another thing is we had a bird's eye view roadmap of the whole show. So editorially, I was always able to go to my VFX editor and see where we are, which direction we're going. Um, and obviously, there's a whole other story to be told about them, the engagement of U-boats, tactics, the way the way the convoys move through through uh, the North Atlantic. All of this was was carefully mapped out so we didn't get lost because like Pete said, it's the, it, there's nothing out there but, you know, horizon and the only way to know where you're going was, you know, obviously, you know, for us, visually the sun, you know, and we were constantly having to check ourselves because, you know, the convoys were constantly, um, you know, zigzagging and using tactics to avoid um, any, any kind of, you know, the shooting duck situation that they were in with the, with the, uh, with the wolf pads. I'll stop talking for a sec. Great, our next question comes from Andrea Lands. Hi guys, thank you both for joining us today and providing so much incredible insight already. So one of my favorite parts about watching a film on streaming is you can watch it over and over again, and especially after speaking to you, I wanna watch it again. And so what do you suggest audiences, this question is for both of you, by the way, what element do you suggest audiences look for the second or third time they watch it to really gain a deeper appreciation of the film and something they may have missed because they didn't see it in theaters? Um, I think that it was just, it was designed to be on the big screen, you know, and so which which um, you know obviously today you know we're in a whole different world and and you know I think it's brilliant that that Apple picked it up and it was able to be seen and um, the scale of what and the impact um, on the big screen was 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 amazing. I mean Pete was seeing it. Um, you know, in, in London, I was seeing it, you know, uh, with, at Company 3, and it, it was huge. What, what I think people would look at, and, and this has come from a few, a few of the, even the older folks who have seen the show, is to explain to them that it wasn't real. You know what I mean? The, there was no opening sequence with a plane, you know, saying, you know, tally-ho and off you go. You know, um, I, you have to explain, you know, like, to... to to my father, I had to explain to him, no, 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 that was actually there. We, we built this. And the, the takeaway for audiences, I think, would be ho hopefully that, that you can get through the film and not cringe and think that it is, you know, um, completely CG. Um, I hope that people think that maybe it was a combination. You know, I hope that we, I hope that, that we got people guessing um, on the techniques on how we, we went about making this film um, because we were painted into a corner and we had one choice and that was to do it the way we did it. And Pete and I are very in-camera technique guys, but we both have a technical background, but we both have an organic touch, but we had to go very technical. But at the same time, we kept it very, um, very practical and organic in the way we did our dialogue together. Um, and I hope that if people were to see this and know a little bit more about what we're doing and what we did, um, that the world was created um, for, for, for in, the, in a full CG environment, um, um, following all of the cues from from uh, Tom, really. Um, and, you know, that's something that I don't think we've been able to actually say yet to anyone. <laughs> I think it's actually a really interesting question, actually, Andre. And I think that any, any, I should say, certainly for any any Tom Hanks war film or any good war film, if you've watched the first time you watch it, if you're inspired to then go and look into it, right, particular battles or, for example, Band of Brothers with the 101st, 
like I've done similar things, not that I've been in more water than that, but I am a certain age that I enjoy that stuff. And I think that is quite critical. I think lights down, obviously it's a shame that it's not on the big screen because the actual gamut of color that you have in the North Atlantic in the middle of winter with gray ships on a gray ocean with a gray sky, obviously the subtleties there, I was always worried from a technical point of view that some of that may have been lost with people's fancy plasmas or whatever, you know, because it, it has to be, the grading there is very subtle. And I think that um, if you watch the film, if someone wants to come in to watch it again, then I would say, just go and briefly look up the Battle of the North Atlantic mm. and, and you will see what was actually undertaken by, by, the, um, by the crewmen and, and just what was achieved under such, I mean, it is, it's generally a turkey shoe. They couldn't see their adversary, you know, it was there and they were just getting shot out of the, out of the water, left front and center and left for dead. And I think that's, and they are out of range, of course, which you get from the film, you know, the Catalinas, the circles they draw and then that middle bit is just a ghost town essentially. And I think that's what I get from it. And when I watched it for the second time, I did go, you know, I didn't really know a huge amount about the Battle of the North Atlantic, let's, let's be fair. There were certain things that Nathan and the actual naval advisor that Nathan's team had, Gordo, mm -hmm. told us about stuff and about certain scenarios in the film, which you'd think would be unbelievable, like mm -hmm. submarines actually servicing right next to escort, escort ships, which you mm -hmm. think, you know, why would they do that? It's insane. But they knew that they couldn't depress those cranes down close enough. And they knew the closer they got, the more effective they'd be at taking that thing out. And I thought, well, why, you know, but until you read it, until you actually know about it, then you don't know. And I think that's what's quite interesting because what you have to understand of these films, you're not making up sequences here. They're very authentic to what actually happened. And I think that's what's key. It's also what's critical to what makes the film feel real. You know, we, 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 we went to the, um, not extreme, but we went to the level of listening to um, a journalist on, you know, the merchant ships while attacks are occurring and they're recording their dialogue. So there, um, there's amazing um, accounts of the descriptions from, from that moment in time. We had this, we we're listening to this. So it helped us try to understand and to try to be a part of, of the film on the visual standpoint and also uh, to put ourselves in that situation as well as um, a filmmaking situation as well as a character situation. Great, our next question comes from Aid Freetanzer. Sorry, you can actually, uh, you can skip me, thank you. Oh, perfect. Um, I will have our next question that one. from Boris. <laughs> Yes, hello. What should be for you a great collaboration between a visual effect supervisor and a director? And my second question, in a word, what can you tell us about your collaboration with Aaron Schneider? Thank you. Okay. Um, we, uh, first question was visual effects, super, the, our visual effects supervising communication in, in this situation was a more of a collaborative um, conversation because it was um, Aaron Ryder from, from Film Nation um, and Tom and Gary, um, Tom Hanks and Gary Gosling from Playtone. Um, we came in and, you know, I, I sat in a dark room with Tom for hours as he tried to describe to me how he felt um, when he developed the screenplay and when he how he felt, how awful and just and 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 how gut wrenching it must have been for 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 the for the for the merchant the merchantmen and for the for the naval and also for the for the U boat. He, he, he that was more valuable than anything to, is to have that communication just look you in the eye and tell you that so so heartfelt. So that and 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 um, with Aaron Snyder, who was very um, uh, persistent in reality, you know, there is no tricks, there is no whiz bang. This is it's all it's all based on a real situation, which is, you know, very 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 strongly pu pushed forward by Tom. Um, 
and at the time that Pete and I were on, it was really the, the communication with, with, with Tom and Gary and, and Aaron and Aaron Ryder. Um, and it was really a very small team. It was, you know, Pete and I um, really were just engaging with each other every day. I was pre, pre visiting like mad with the small team. Um, and that was kind of the, the organicness of what was going on. And uh, the Sydney, our editors and, and our VFX team were, were, we were putting sequences together. We were presenting them to, to um, the directors and the filmmakers. And, and, you know, we, I personally was housed at Playtime, which is uh, Tom and Gary's office. So it was a daily thing where I could easily, if I needed to get any feedback, um, the feedback was instant. Um, you know, it was basically, you know, just walk, walk through the door. So that was a very interesting way of, of working and it was very beneficial for us. Um, that was the first question. Could you just repeat the second question, please? Uh, my second question in only one word, what can you tell us about your collaboration with Aaron Schneider? <laughs> oh, okay. The collaboration with Aaron Snyder was was um, you know he he's, he's a he's a director he's a DP he was very um, um, he was very thoughtful about uh, um, the, the the difficulties of what we were in uh, he he wanted to um, he wanted the authentic feel he wanted to give Tom the authentic feel that that I know that I got because Tom Tom and Gary and the guys were really persistent about it um, and he was the great thing about it was he he because he understood visual effects he understood the difficulty so he didn't put the pressure on us to he, he didn't micromanage us see that you know we had to get the job done and he felt that the credentials I think that Pete had and myself I think that he felt that he was, and this is a good thing, he, he felt like he was in good hands. And, and I felt like I was in good hands. I felt like Dineg and, and, and Pete, we, I didn't go for multiple vendors. It was Pete, we had to go for trust. And we, and we had to, we, we, you know, trust was what this was all about. And sometimes you've got to throw everything away and just go with your gut. And the gut was, you know, Pete, Pete and the team. Um, and, and Aaron was so excited when he found out these, you know, you know these the, the caliber of people working on the show. So that was the, the, the greatness, and and you know it was always good feedback. It was always positive. It was that's the the, the joyful part about it was we were left to our experience as visual effects specialists to do our job. And that was what, you know, you know very well that on every film we have to all of a sudden become experts per se at things that we, you know, not experts at. So, you know, we lent on, you know, um, advisors, advisors that I've used all the way back from like Pete said, Master and Commander. We had to lean on each other for, for just keeping up with the, 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 the movie and not dropping the ball in the areas because we had so much to carry. But I think the keeping the group small, even though it was a massive team working on the show, um, but, but keeping us and, and having the freedom to do our job is what the director did. That's what the, Tom Hanks did. That's what Gary did. That's what Aaron Ryder did. And, and I think that's what made it really special for Pete and I, because we really felt like we owned it. We do, we, we, yeah. I, I think just, just from my perspective, um, I didn't have a huge amount of interaction with the director. It was only with Nathan on, on, a, on a regular basis. And the biggest thing for any team that I do when I do a show is to, certainly for something like this, where you're dealing with this particular subject matter, is to try to, um, one, we handpicked the crew for this uh, because of the turnaround and what we needed to do logistically, right? And then the other thing was, is, was to be sure that there was a certain level of enthusiasm for this show, right? And that wasn't hard to gain at all. In fact, the first thing that we did was we, got the crew and then we took them down to the HMS Belfast down at um, London Bridge, right? Which is a World War II destroyer. And that was to give them some idea about just 
what one of these ships actually looks like close up because we didn't know from the shots that we were doing they'd not been designed yet right how close we were going to get you know were they grazing shots we're we going to be seeing weld how did they do the weld? was it kind of messy was it kind of rushed what was the paint like what did they do and the good thing about that weirdly enough is that people got really into it and the crew were interacting with people that actually served on hms belfast in the war right so that already got their attention and all of a sudden that asset that we were building, you know, Greyhound, obviously, all the way through, benefited from that. The shot design benefited from it. And it also allowed a crew of, you know, a thousand plus, not as I took them all down, obviously, it was senior crew that went, to get them onto the same page with what Nathan was doing and what Tom had spent all that time, years developing the script. It's a great way of getting everyone on the same bar to do, do a show like this, because typically visual effects films can be random scatter of all sorts of stuff right this one you, we were so conscientious about the fact that authenticity is critical and uh, that was what we actually brought to it to be sure that we were being respectful to the subject matter right? thank you very much great our next question comes from tony Tolato. gentlemen great to talk to you uh it, you you're, you you design you have the water but you also have torpedoes going through the water and you also have explosions on the ship i mean it's bad enough to design the water but then to have all that going on talk about that process that to me is is really amazing well I, that that, that pro process was we I, we um i i decided to just bring in a a very small crack team of uh, pre-visualization guys, um, guys and girls who really understood, and I, I knew them uh, and they un understood myself, broke down the the, the engagements um, and, and, you know, kind of tried to build sequences that made sense visually, <clears throat> um, you know, um, to per the script. Um, and then we had to really work in a bird's eye view at first when it came to where the torpedoes were coming from, where which ships were getting hit, the speed of the torpedoes, the speed of the ships, the direction of the ships, the everything was very confusing if you didn't look from above, you know, and if you didn't look from above, you would be lost. So that was really the stage one was dissecting the the sequence or what I'd always call just the beats, you know, and you know to to, to each sequence that had a, a big action which had a big interaction between maybe a, a hit on the torpedoes or 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 or, or, or a near miss or anything like this. It was all based on um, developing that from the story from the script, looking at it, previsioning it, doing everything from above first, then bringing the cameras down, then seeing where angles would work and help tell the story. Then, obviously, in the background, we had reference footage of, of you know, damage to ships, uh, explosions on ships. We had, you know, obviously, effect scenes working on that. We had, we had reference footage of torpedoes you know, moving through the water. We had all, we had so much in the background going on. Well, we're, well, we're, you know, to, to, to get the impact and the different types of explosions, because it, de it depended on the ship, it depended on what was it carrying, it depended, it depended on the side, it depended on where, where all of this stuff was being put into consideration through teams. Um, the, the making sense of the story was, was very difficult because of the, where you put the camera. Um, you know, from from a, from the point of view, um, how much do you see? Where's the where the hit? So, the, the, it's a conversation that I we could really honestly talk about for hours. But in a nutshell, it's you know we we always started with looking at everything from above, um, so we could see where we were nautically, <laughs> and what where where was the stuff. Where were the ships? Where were yeah. the torpedoes coming from? What U boat was it coming from? How many? Because obviously, you know, it was, it was, um, even if there were, you know, the merchant ships and other ships and U boats not even in the scene, I, we knew where they were. And you had to know that. If you didn't know that, it would have been an absolute debacle. 
you know, it would have been, you know, who's on first? It would have been ridiculous. So we had we had to have that roadmap of uh, an understanding of the real world. Um, and that real world then enabled us to get our cameras, place our cameras, do what we needed to do, see what's missing, see what was reading, how long. And the effects then started to drive it, the look started to drive it, the, you know, we, that's a, that's a, a, a quick answer. It's, a, <laughs> it's, it's quite true, actually. And I think what's nice about this show, actually, um, is the fact that typically on other shows, I would say, there's always a little bit of compositional cheating, right, to find that shot. And I, what I love about this is that we were so brutally um, truthful and honest because um, it would be, again, you're taking it out of it being um, authentic if you're cheating stuff. So if a particular escort couldn't get there in time because it was a Canadian class and it wasn't as fast as some of the Greyhound ships and could only do X amount of time and it was carrying this load and we calculated loads, we calculated displacement, we calculated all of that. So if it couldn't get to a particular area to help someone out, well, that's how it was going to be, right? If there was another sub that was here that we knew that was firing um, a torpedo. And again, the one thing you should know, I mean, we, I guess and this one, one thing I didn't realize is, of course, they fire to where the ship's going to go. So you, there's a scene in the film where it just goes right past, you know, and then they obviously they track it back. You know, they do a reverse, whatever it is, azimuth. And there's all that stuff I find really fascinating. So when you see all this mayhem going on and the chaos, that is how it was. That was the fog of war, these 20 mils, the bow fours, the explosions of the torpedoes, all of that stuff I find fascinating. And, and that what gives that real, again, when we looked at the authentic footage, there is that. And it's that sort of some of those scenes that, that as, you know, um, Saving Private Ryan for the beach scene, you know, it's that sort of stuff that brings her who was there, uh, the people that are actually there have a real kind of feeling and that's actually a little bit too raw. And I think that's the kind of thing that we felt that we really needed to achieve. So, you know, the, there's a particular scene, I'm jumping off the gun here slightly at the nighttime sequences, where I remember I showed my wife a particular scene where a ship the Greyhound nearly grazed one of the huge um, tankers, I think it was, one of the passenger ships. And you think, well, how the hell that could happen? That things like massive. And it did happen because they couldn't see anything. You could see barely a few meters in front of you because everything was a complete lockdown. I mean, Nathan was telling me an interesting story. If you were a, if you were a naval guy, you get you get uh, reprimanded, or was it sent to the brig or whatever? If you had a cigarette on the on the on yeah, the yeah, line, right? Because you can see that light a mile away or whatever, you know. So I mean, stuff like that, errors like that cost lives, and I think that's what's nice about this. So shots respected that, scenes respected that, and that again is very much directly related to what Tom wrote, and that's what we wanted to be very sure that we were doing. And that roadmap that Nathan's referring to it was all designed by radar maps done by Gordo and everyone else about what would happen in a particular scenario if the U-boat was spotted here, who would go, what would happen to the convoy. So we, we basically took all those roadmaps and there were scores of them into one giant master scene from our perspective, one giant layout master scene that you could basically scrub through like a little mini battleships. So we knew what you would see at a particular, any, any point in time in the film, what Tom would see when he was looking off the starboard or the port bow, or whatever at the stir, you know, at whatever time. I think that's critical to a type of film like this. Okay. Great. Our next question comes from Casey Mendoza. Hey, uh, this is a very general question, but I'm so fascinated by the evolution of visual effects and the advancements in the technology of the industry. Um, so I wanted to ask, what are you excited to see more of in the future of the effects and entertainment? And what do you hope to do more of or experiment with in future projects? Um, it's funny because you're the only one who's ever asked that question. And I'm the only one who's ever actually answered that question without the question being answered. Um, <laughs> You know, the takeaway from Greyhound was, I feel that, I feel like um, movies, movies, movies made around ocean is always a run for the hills kind of situation in a lot of cases. Um, you know, uh, you know, water, water, old shit, and here we go. You know, I, I feel like we went into a world of, um, I think we took it to another place or I feel like there's a, a world or a future in more gritty films um, 
you know, on the historical, because God knows there's that many on, you know, land on, on the war. Um, that I think that we've opened up a, 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 an avenue where we can have complete control. We can, and we can do better. We know we can and not saying we did bad. I'm just saying we, this was, this was very calculated in the way that what we wanted to get done. But I think that we were fascinated on where it could go as, 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 you know, senior guys who have been there, been there for quite a while, for the 25 God years, you know, Pete and I, you know, probably, you know, half a bloody century. But I feel that it's opened up the, the world of, of quality, I think. I think we could almost create believability now. And, and that to me is the exciting part because, you know, you wouldn't want, you know, you'd want to do another Master and Commander now. You know, you, you want to do a, a sick, you, you, I feel like you could almost relax a, a, product, um, a studio by saying, look, this is the tip of the iceberg. You know, with, with more time, we can keep developing. And I, I feel like it's not just the technology. I think that's a big part of it. Um, it, it, it is a big part of it, but it's also the, 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 um, the right people, right team uh, and right mentality. Um, uh, you know, using the, the, the it's still, uh, it was still a lot of manpower, like Pete said, nearly a thousand, thousand stuff. So there, it's a big wheel to turn, but I feel like there is a future that can bring up, it can bring writers and storytellers um, more for the first, for, for me, for the first time that I feel. Agreed. I mean, for me, I think that, that from, if I was to, you know, technology is a huge thing with this film, surely, purely because of the amount of effects. So there's a huge amount of number crunching going on. And what is beautiful now, which is just, you know, the game industry and Unreal Engine, all the rest of it, utilizing that so you can bring a finished visual and design that with the director and the filmmakers so they feel like they're there shooting that thing for real is the thing I think which is exciting because there's always going to be a little bit of turnaround time and leeway for this stuff based off basically hard render power and calculating. And I think that that sort of thing, the closer you can get to making it feel like you're gonna go down onto a set or go onto a location and shoot this thing and everyone's there, you know, that's what really helped because it gets everyone into the actual mindset. And I'm including actors on that and getting them into the field. So they're just not, you know, typically visual, visual effects is green screen, holding a green cushion for a tiger, you know, and getting people on board with that is always a bit tricky. So I think that technology for me is definitely a thing that will help bring uh, a film like this to the forefront of making it feel a little bit more uh, real and authentic and getting everyone I think, nude. I think our technology is so far ahead now that we have time to be artists. Yeah, yeah, but that's the thing, right? You know, you know we have time to, to, to um, um, talk and do dialogue like filmmakers, like, like cinematographers, like, a camera crew, like a, like a, a, a you know, like a, um, you know, like a, a cam op, you know, we can talk that way. And we've got time to, to execute that way because yeah, technology is, 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 is better and faster. And, and we've got time to be more, um, more filmic in, in the way we, we talk to each other. Uh, you know, and I'm talking about us, Pete and I, I'm going, I mean, God help, God help us, the guy, you know, talking about the, you know, their, their numbers and, um, but that, that, the, the, there's all these avenues now and skill sets that are really now come together to allow us to be more filmmakers. I think we've got about five minutes now, haven't we? So we should try to get some more Yes, questions. our last question is going to be from Marvin. I'm not allowed. Um, speaking of the innovations that you judiciously and successfully implemented and executed in this um, film, um, wherein you literally move heaven, earth, and the vastness of the ocean, of the sea of the water, in the most magically possible ways. Um, my question is, what effect do you think will this have on the overall weather and tide of filmmaking, especially in the context of the COVID pandemic that we are into? Um, 
Yeah. Sorry, I'll I'll keep it real quick. I think we've opened up some avenues to to be able to, you know, to do as we've done. We we you know there were, you know you could basically shoot Tom you know on a, on a set and we can build the movie around it. Um, that I I think that's I I feel like we've opened up the doors to 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 being able to present quality filmmaking ar around a situation like this. Pete Pete would be able to answer this one better to be honest. Uh, yeah, I mean, for, for me, I mean, I've just finished a film, another film, literally, it was a pandemic show. And I think that th what you tend to do with these things is you try to overcome as best you can and still maintain the quality of the product. And I think that, weirdly enough, from a, from our side of view as filmmakers, a visual effects point of view, it's opened up a lot of different avenues and a lot of di a kind of um, more structured and lateral thinking to how you solve an issue and solve problems. So big CG film like this, plates, ocean, you can blend all that together and, and try to do it in the best possible way, but still retain some of that authenticity that you get about being on a film crew on a set. And I think from a technical point of view and the advances of technology, that's always going to go. You know, that's always going to go better and better and there'll be a more finished image because I was only discussing the day about previews and back in my day, it used to be stick figures and two colours. Now it's almost like a finished film. And I think that's what people expect. It's whatever you can get to the closest final product in order to try to sell that idea, sell that concept. And I think, sorry, one, one, one thing, but what's, what's very, very important is that the understanding of sets, you know, so, you know, we can create a world without a, a camera crew, but we can't if we don't understand how a camera crew works, how a camera works, how a piece of equipment works. You will not get the authenticity of a film without the experience of working with rigs, rigs that break, the imperfections, all of this comes with the filmmaking on set experience. Otherwise you're, you're not, you, you, don't, you don't understand what it's like. You don't understand, put, you've got to put yourself on the piece of equipment you think you're gonna be using and the, ca the camera operator's abilities. And if you haven't done that and stood with guys and been on the wheels you know, or been on uh, you know, an arm or been on a handheld and done this, for you, it's, it's, it's very hard to generate the, the realism of, of, of filmmaking. You know, that's where you're taking, visual effects is one thing, but the understanding of, 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 of filmmaking is absolutely crucial. Yeah. All right, and that wraps yes. up today's press conference. Nathan and Pete, thank you guys so much for taking the time to speak with everybody and answering all our questions. Excellent, thank you everyone. You're welcome, bye.